All right, this, it's a good opportunity for me to get to come and, and introduce Barb Jackson, our speaker this morning. Um, as I understand it, Easter is one of her favorite seasons, and this is a great time for her uh, to be able to come and share with us about the Easter season and the message that we have to learn today. Um, she is a former pastor. Um, she also serves on our board here at the church, and she leads our family care team, which goes out and helps uh, provide in times of need for those that are members of our church and also some that are not members of our church. So at this time, I'd like to invite Barbara to come up and, and share her message with us. Good morning. It is a privilege to... Uh, be able to bring the Easter message this morning. Easter is the high point of the Christian year. It is the culmination of everything that we talk about throughout the year. And without Easter Sunday, none of the rest of it really matters. So I truly uh, feel privileged to be able to be in the pulpit this morning. How many of you have ever owned a piece of reversible clothing? Anybody over the course of your years? We've got a few. I remember when I was a child, and I, I think it was a wraparound skirt. If you remember wraparound skirts, I remember my mom getting me a piece of reversible clothing, and I just thought that was the coolest thing. It might be a solid color on one side, and then you turn it the other way around, and the seams are finished on both sides, so you can wear it either way. There's no inside out on it, and I thought that was pretty cool too. So you turn it the other way. Maybe it's a solid on one side, and it's a print on the other. Or in the case of this piece of reversible clothing that I made just for this sermon... Um, <laughs> I had a heck of a time making this thing because I took a jacket that was not stretchy and one that was, wa that was stretchy and I sewed them together and it, it took me an entire afternoon literally because they're not meant to go together. But I wanted to make a piece, since I don't own anything reversible, I wanted to make a piece of reversible clothing for you. And so I came up with this jacket. So if I'm not feeling the black mood, I can switch this around to bright green. And this bright green, when I saw this at the thrift store, I thought, oh, we have got to have this because, well, it just goes with my sermon today. But you know what? Right now... I'm not feeling the bright green. I'm feeling the black. So let's get this turned back around to the black side because I'm just not in a green mood at the moment. I'm in more of a black mood. So we got this flipped back around, and now we have a nice dark black jacket. And there's nothing wrong with black. I happen to like black. But we've got it back to the black side, okay? So... You know, as you start out in life, early on you begin to figure out that there are some things in our world that are reversible. You begin to figure out if you paint your bedroom walls bright blue, which was my favorite when I, color when I was a kid, if you decide you really don't like bright blue walls, you can reverse that and paint them a different color. It can be changed. Sometimes you make a decision and you figure out that wasn't the best decision. Maybe you broke up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend and you realized you'd made a real mistake. Sometimes you can reverse that decision. So we begin to figure out early on in life that there are some things that are reversible. But then we also begin to figure out in life that there are those things that are not reversible. Once it's done, it's done. There's no going back. I'm a volunteer at Selby Hospital, and I volunteer in the rehabilitation unit. And so um, I go in and I visit with people, and I just sit and listen to them and, you know, um, just what's on their mind, you know, that kind of thing. Talk to them. I enjoy doing that. And sometimes at the nurse's station, they'll say, I want you to make sure you see someone in room 104 or whatever. They've just had an amputation. That's one of the more traumatic things for people on that unit. Now, I can guarantee you 
that before that amputation took place, that surgeon came into that room and he asked what sounds like an absolutely ridiculous question. He'll say, which leg are we operating on? And you think, duh, you know, you're the surgeon, you've got the notes. Why does he ask that question? Because once he cuts that leg off, that surgery is not reversible. And so he takes his marker and he puts an X on the spot that he's going to work on. Because he doesn't want to be the one that makes a mistake like that that can't be changed back. On a more serious note, how many of you remember how old you were when you first figured out what it meant for a pet or a person that you knew and you were close to to die? When you first realized the finality of death, when you realized they weren't coming back, you realized they were gone. I'm guessing most everyone in this room remembers when that really first sank in. Some of you may be familiar with Christian author Philip Yancey. So he, he wrote a story that, that kind of spoke to my heart that I'd like to share with you. It's about his first introduction to the concept of death. He said that as a young child, he came to associate Easter with death and not the resurrection. Because of what happened one Easter Sunday to his six-week-old kitten named Boots. So Yancey's mother had insisted. She had set a firm date that on Easter Sunday, little Boots was going to be taken outside and introduced to the outside world, and he was going to learn to defend himself on Easter Sunday. That's when that was going to happen. That was going to be the day for the big test. And so Easter Sunday finally arrived. They took the little kitten outside, and he kept the family entertained. You can only imagine chasing butterflies, hopping around in the grass, exploring, maybe discovering bugs, whatever. But the family was absolutely enthralled watching little Boots get to experience the great outdoors for the first time. Until the neighbor kids came over for an Easter egg hunt and trotting along behind the neighborhood kids was their dog. And when the dog spotted the little kitten, before the family had a chance to intervene, the unthinkable happened in a flash. The dog pounced on the kitten and killed it. Yancey said, I couldn't have articulated it at the time, but what I learned that Easter under the noonday sun was the ugly word irreversible. Boots was dead, irreversibly dead. You know the finality of death? That idea of it being irreversible is a horrible concept for children and adults alike to wrap their minds around, to comprehend, to accept. It's a horrible idea. Let's take a step back in time now to Golgotha, to the scene of a Roman crucifixion. And there hangs Jesus, the one whom his followers had pinned all of their hopes on. not only for this life, but for the next. They had followed him for three years, eaten with him, talked with him. 
ask him questions, learn from him. For three years, they had been together as a group, and there hangs Jesus on a Roman cross. You know, when Jesus spoke those horrible words, do you remember what they were? It is finished. When he spoke those horrible words, all of his followers, the disciples, the women who had followed along caring for the needs of Jesus and his disciples over that three-year period of time, all of his followers interpreted those words as marking the end of his life, the end of his mission, the end of all the wonderful promises that he had made to them. It was the end. That's what they thought those words meant. It is finished, done, over. We have to believe that because of what happens going forward. We have to believe they really did think it was over. It was a failed mission. They probably battled a range of emotions from disappointment to confusion to hurt to anger. I can only imagine what they were feeling. Some of them probably even felt like real fools. How could I have been so stupid as to, to, to buy into this, to think Jesus was who he said he was, the Son of God, the Messiah? And so as the Sabbath drew near, Jesus was placed in a tomb. No one felt the need to stay and keep watch. What would, there, what would there be to keep watch for? They didn't expect anything to happen. They didn't expect to ever see Jesus again. And we, when we talk about black being, you know, the mood, think about how people wear black to a funeral. Black was definitely the color that would have described how they felt at this point point in time. They were absolutely despondent and without hope. How, how otherwise could you explain that they didn't stay and keep watch? If they thought a resurrection was going to occur, they would have stayed there and camped out and, and kept a close watch. They would have been zeroed in on that tomb with the, the rock in place of it. Because the Sabbath began on Friday evening, no one could come to visit the tomb of Jesus until the Sabbath was over at sundown on Saturday. So now in the wee hours of Sunday morning, we find Mary Magdalene and her friends making their way to the tomb. Come with me to the garden tomb. We're going to be doing a dramatic reading from John chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran ran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth, that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back home. So let's stop at this point and make a few observations before we read the rest of the passage. 
Mary, knowing full well that Jesus was dead in the tomb, and he was dead. You'll hear people argue the death of Jesus on the cross, the, the, the crucifixion. Um, if you like to read what scholars have to say about and skeptics have to say about it. And there are so many arguments about he wasn't really dead, he was only in a coma, so on and so forth. Jesus was dead. He did die via the crucifixion that he experienced. Dave and I have been listening to um, a, a series of uh, uh, lessons um, done by a, a, a gentleman who was a former Muslim, and uh, he was talking about the resurrection and, and sharing that in all of history of the Romans uh, executing people by, uh, by crucifixion, that there's only one account of someone ever surviving it. The, the, uh, they were asked to be taken down from the, the cross by someone passing by, and they were resuscitated and recovered from it. There's only one account of someone ever surviving uh, a crucifixion. Jesus did die on the cross, and Mary knew that. So she, when she went to the tomb and she saw the empty tomb, the only logical explanation that she could come up with is someone had taken the body. She didn't know who, she didn't know why, but someone had stolen the body. So Mary wasted no time in letting John and Peter in on her horrible discovery. You know, it's kind of amazing. Have you ever noticed how much faster bad news travels than what good news d does? Anytime we discover something bad, we have got to go tell someone, don't we? We've got to get on the phone. We've got to get on social media. We have got to get the word out. You're not going to believe what just happened. Something bad happened. And so Mary has made a terrible discovery, and she has got to find Peter and John and tell them what's happened. And this is where the account to me gets really fascinating. John got there first. He took a quick look. Empty grave, burial cloths laying there. Yep, Mary was right. He's gone. And next up is Peter, who actually, the scripture tells us, he did go into the tomb. He saw the same thing. Had to agree with Mary. Jesus is gone, missing but the interesting thing is, he showed absolutely no emotion whatsoever. After making this very unsettling discovery, the scriptures don't give us any emotional response whatsoever. And I just, I find that extremely interesting. But then John, he decided to step inside the tomb. He didn't go in the first time. He decided to step inside the tomb himself and see that it was empty. And it was when he took that closer look, it was when he took that second look, the scripture tells us that he saw and he believed. He believed in his mind that the death just might be reversible after all. Just maybe what Jesus had been trying to tell them about the resurrection really was true. You know what John shows us here that's a really valuable lesson? Is the importance of coming back again for a second look and a third look and a fourth look and however many looks you need to take. When you come up against a scripture you don't understand, when God is trying to show you something or teach you a lesson and you don't quite get what he's trying to show you, there is value. There is nothing wrong with not getting it the first time around. I can be kind of a dense person and a slow thinker, and I oftentimes have to come back again for multiple looks before the light bulb comes on, but it is always worth the effort the discoveries and what God has to show you in his word, personal lessons that he has for you, what he wants to teach you, it is always worth the effort to come back for another look. 
I feel like God really honors that. I feel like he is really honored by that when we are willing to do that and not just walk away from it easily. So even though John saw and believed, he and Peter still couldn't quite fully comprehend the significance of the empty tomb. Why do I say that? Because of verse 10. What'd they do? They ran around and started telling everybody, right? Is that what verse 10 said? They went back home. They just packed up and went back home. This is in itself is a huge problem because if they don't get it, they're not going to be willing to risk their lives going back out there into a world that's pretty wound up about Jesus, pretty wound up about this this, this false Messiah who's been crucified, they are not going to be able and willing to go back out into that hostile world and start sharing the good news with people that Jesus has risen from the dead. So it's really important that they get it. But at this point in time, the scripture tells us they went back home. And they left Mary standing there crying. Let's continue reading with verse 11. Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said. Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. She turned to him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to my father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. So... Mary's reaction was something like this. Oh my gosh, I thought Jesus was dead, that we'd never see him again. I thought the empty tomb meant that Jesus' body had been stolen. But I have seen the Lord with my own eyes. I have seen the angels in the tomb. I heard their message. I saw Jesus face to face with my own eyes. He is risen. He is alive. So death really is reversible after all. And this is why I wanted the bright green. Because the black represents death and the green represents the light bulb going on for Mary when she figured out that death really is reversible. It made sense to her. The light bulb went on. And what was her next response? Scripture tells us, and then she went home. Is that what it tells us? Is that what she did? No, she didn't just get home. Scripture tells us that she had to go and find the disciples and tell them the good news. What a striking difference between the disciples and Mary. The disciples saw and believed, but at this point in time, it really didn't make a difference in their lives. They weren't changed by the discovery. Mary, on the other hand, saw and believed and was immediately changed. No going back to business as usual. This woman was on a mission. 
what a difference it should make in each one of our lives. We have to put ourselves into the Easter story at this point in time, into the scriptures. Therefore, us today, not just for those people a couple of thousand years ago, these scriptures, this story is for us today, and we need to put ourselves into this situation. What a difference it should make for us when we see and believe and understand the reality and the implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Scripture tells us that because he lives, we too will live. Scripture tells us that he was the first fruit and we are the fruit that follows. Jesus doesn't want us to just go back to business as usual. He wants us to go out and find people who do not yet know what we know, who haven't heard the good news, who don't understand the good news about Jesus Christ. It's not something that, okay, I know, that's good, I'm good, I've got eternal life. It's meant to be shared. So here we sit on Resurrection Day, peering once again into the empty tomb. Jesus doesn't want us to just peer into that tomb and remain unmoved today, unchanged, untouched. We're peering into that empty tomb today just like Mary and Peter and John did so long ago. You know what's fasc about, fascinating about this day? Is that the reactions of people today are much like they were so many years ago to this empty tomb. People of other religions peer into that empty tomb and they'll, it's a lie. It never happened. Some non-religious experts and religious experts alike, believe it or not, will peer into that empty tomb. And they'll study it long and hard, trying to come up with some kind of an explanation that will finally debunk the resurrection myth once and for all. As far as they're concerned, when you're dead, you're dead. I had someone say that to me a while back. They were explaining to me, when you're dead, you're dead. That's it. It's over. They want people to think it's just wishful thinking. Someone else told me recently, it's a nice story, but that's all it is. It's a nice story. And believe it or not, even some Christians are beginning to tr turn away from the truth of the resurrection. I was talking to, to Stephen this past week. We were talking about this. And I mentioned that to Stephen. He's like, really? He's like, that doesn't make sense. And I said, no, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense at all. Don't do it right now. I don't want to see any po phones popping out. Unless you're reading the scriptures on your phone like my husband does. No phones popping out to look this up, but later on today, Google, what percentage of Christians don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Seems like a silly question, doesn't it? A low estimate, 25 to 30 percent, that's a low estimate. And then Google, what percentage of ministers no longer believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That seems like an even more ridiculous question, doesn't it? In the Church of England, 30%. The
The reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is at the very core of what we believe as Christians. It is at the core of our doctrine. It is not a myth. It is not subject to debate by anyone. I don't care how much teaching you have. It is not open for debate. If we take our scissors, and people like to take scissors to Scripture these days. If we take our scissors to our Bibles, and we remove the teaching of the resurrection, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ from our Bibles, then nothing else makes sense. Everything falls apart at that point in time because it is at the pinnacle of everything that we teach. Nothing else makes sense. If you want to read a really good argument on the resurrection, read what Paul has to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It doesn't get any better than that. And you know what he concludes? He concludes that if Christ didn't raise from the dead, then neither will we. And he also says that if it is not the truth, then I, for one, am an absolute liar for standing up here and telling you that it is the truth, and you are fools for continuing to buy into this lie. And it is an absolute waste of your time to continue to practice the Christian faith. It all falls apart if you take, aw take away the reality of the resurrection. And then there are other people, and I am talking about different groups of people today because it's interesting um, just how people come at the resurrection. There are other people who they've never taken a close look for themselves. They just believe because the church told them, or they believe because a Sunday school teacher told them back when they were a child. And so for them, it's, it's, it's head knowledge. It's not made its way to their heart. And they remain strangely unmoved by the reality of the resurrection. It just never really sinks in or makes a difference in how they live. You know, on occasion, I hear Christians say something that just really gets on my nerves, and we're going to have to go back to black for me to talk about this because it gets on my nerves that bad. So I will hear people say sometimes, and you know, sometimes I think we don't really stop and think about what it sounds like to the Lord when we say some things. And I think we need to think about this one because I think about, I wonder what the Lord thinks about that when he hears people say that. I can't imagine that that sits real well with him. So people will be going through, you know, hard time. More and more illnesses are starting to pile up in their lives, more aches and pains and you know i can relate i'm not a spring chicken anymore i can relate to what they're saying i'd have to agree that yep that's kind of how how it plays out if you live long enough and they'll be going on about life's getting hard and illnesses and aches and pains and this that and the other I'm talking about Christians. It doesn't get on my nerves when somebody who's not a Christian says it, but when somebody who's a Christian says this, it gets on my last nerves. Well, you know, life is looking bleak and black. When I consider the alternative, this is better than that. And I'm thinking to my myself when you consider the alternative the alternative to death you consider the alternative the alternative is new life in jesus christ in heaven forever and ever that is the alternative to our difficulties here 
on earth. God never promised that in this word. People will say, and they say these are the golden years. You know what? These are not the golden years. These are the years that are going to lead up to the golden years someday. When we cross over to the other side, those are going to be golden years. Golden years. There will be no disappointment whatsoever. Folks, when we consider the alternative to life here on earth, and it's not that life here on earth is not good. I have had a wonderful life. But the alternative to that, the alternative to death, only gets better and better. The alternative de to death truly is the golden years that will last for all of eternity. There's a third group of Christians, and those Christians are called Easter people. And when I heard, first heard that phrase, I thought, I like that phrase. I want to be called one of the Easter people. Believers who are filled with joy this morning as they once again gaze into the empty tomb and marvel at the thought that Jesus Christ defeated death once and for all. Marvel at the thought that what appeared to be irreversible has been reversed forever for all who believe. Jesus really did take the sting out of death. Not just for himself, but for all who believe in him and the reality of his resurrection from the dead. In John 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asked a piercing question. He said, do you believe this? You want to know when I first just knew for a fact, I knew 100% that I believed even though I died, I would live again. I'm not going to go into the whole story. It's a, it's a long mess. Went on for about four months from the first time that they discovered that a tumor was growing within me that was the size of a basketball till the time that tumor was finally taken out. I was 47, 47 years old. And it was kind of a fiasco from start to finish. I ended up at Cleveland Clinic, which was a very bad experience for me. And I have a history of not uh, coming out from underneath the influence of anesthesia very well at all. It takes me a long time to wake up. A colonoscopy that my husband stays awake and watches the camera move around. A couple of hours later, they're finally getting me awake. That kind of thing. It's ridiculous. It's happened many times. So I get to Cleveland Clinic to have this, my kidney and this large tumor removed. And I tell the anesthesiologist, I am very hard to wake up. I have a history of not waking up well at all. And I could tell he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, we've heard that before. People just exaggerate. I could tell that I hadn't been heard. And I knew for a fact they were going to have to put me under and out for a while to be able to do what they needed to do. And before I went through the doors, I was on the cart getting ready to go through the doors to have that surgery, and I knew, I knew for a fact that it was 
very likely that I would not wake up in this world, that I would wake up in the next world. And I said to the Lord, basically, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I am in a win-win situation. If I wake up on this side, praise the Lord. I've got more time to live for you, to serve you, to be with my family and friends. Praise the Lord. That's all good. But if I wake up on the other side, better yet, I'm going to see my Savior face to face. And I went through those doors with no fear in my heart, knowing full well there was a real good chance I was going to wake up on the other side and it was all good. I told the Lord I am in a win-win situation. And I knew then that I believed with my whole heart that Jesus had taken the sting out of death. Well, as you can see, I did wake up on this side. That surgery was early in the morning. My poor family sat in the waiting room all day long. At 10.30 at night, they got me awake. And the first thing they said to me was, we thought we were going to lose you. <laughs> I thought, oh, really? <laughs> my goodness but you know what what a difference it makes when you know what you know what you know I invite you to look at once again into the empty tomb and consider Jesus' words I am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And Jesus is looking each one of us in the eye, and he is saying, do you believe this? No one else can answer that question for you. The answer to that simple question will matter for each one of us for all of eternity. If your answer is yes, then you have good news to tell. Don't just go back home like the disciples did and do nothing with the news. Go out there and proclaim it like Mary did. Let it make a real difference in your life. Let it take away your fear of death. Let it fill your heart with love and joy and hope that is contagious where other people think, I want to have what you have. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then death is reversible for you. Even though you die, you will live again in heaven with our Lord and Savior. Our closing hymn today, I believe, is going to be Christ the Lord is Risen Today. One of my absolute favorite songs. And if you believe in the power and the glory and the reality of the resurrection, I want you to sing that from your heart with just enthusiasm and joy and hope and love for our Lord. Would you pray with me? Father God, we do thank you for this glorious Easter morning, for this time that we have had to come together and celebrate the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that as we leave this place, we would leave with a willingness and a desire to go out and proclaim the good news to those who have not yet heard. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.